enjoy. All right, we still, I mean, as expected, we don't have any attendees as of now because we just sent out the confirmation emails. Uh, how do you want to do this, Adam? Do you want to, uh, we have one attendee. People are joining in. <laughs> hey, everyone. Welcome to Be Waste Twice. And uh, this is Shweta Bindapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Twice. Uh, we're sorry for a bit of a mess up on the type, on the listing that was a fault at Be Waste Twice. And, and thank you for joining in despite uh, the last minute update in the timing. Uh, today, I mean, yeah, hang on. Yes. Today, we're going to talk about what's the best metric to drive down uh, consumption uh, and drive circularity. And we have Adam Reed from Suez Recycling and Recovery, who's moderating the webinar today. And uh, those of, some of you might have already seen other webinars that he's moderated on Be Waste Wise. You'll anyway find them on the video panel section. And uh, Adam is going to talk to Rami Salemdeep, who is an environmental analyst at Zero Waste Scotland. We have Susan Evans. She's a senior policy advisor at Green Lions. Uh, please drop in your questions in the Q&A section. And over to you, Adam. Thanks, Weta. And uh, apologies again for the confusion on, uh, on timings, depending on where you are in the world. And, uh, and a good afternoon, good morning, or good evening. Or if you're watching this back in, uh, in rerun, good whatever. Um, yeah, so I'm Dr. Adam Reid, External Affairs Director at Suez, uh, but I'm also the President of the Chartered Institution of Wastes Management, which means I get to think about these big questions. So it's great to be here with, uh, with, with the panel, um, looking at a topic that I think is really pertinent because it's not that long ago that we're all in Glasgow, and I mean all of us, uh, talking, talking COP26 and decarbonisation, and already I'm starting to ask the question, well, where do we go next and how do we go beyond and is carbon enough? So as somebody that spent a good 25 years, and I know I don't look that old, in waste, waste management and the last 10 years in resource management, um, I, I've seen a number of metrics. I've seen a number of tools. Um, I, I lived in a world where we went weight-based tonnage targets away from landfill to anything else. And then we went recycling rate targets, um, which was still a bit weight-based. Uh, and then we had carbon targets and we had things like the rate model when you were assessing different technologies and you compared a number of different um, environmental criteria um, when deciding on your strategy or your infrastructure. But in the end, it seems that all of those criteria have kind of disappeared. And the only criteria we talk about, and certainly for the last three years, has been carbon. We've got you know, net zero carbon, we've got decarbonization, we've got you know, a, a zero carbon plan, we've got zero sectors that are all about zero carbon. Um, and, and, and all the global commitments seem to be carbon-based. And, and is that right, I suppose, is the question. I mean, clearly moving away from weight-based targets, I'm a fan of, because I think that, that, that drives you to do certain things like collect garden waste because it's heavy. That isn't necessarily good from a carbon perspective or good from a resource perspective. So I think that's why today's discussion is so, so important. And we know that Zero Waste Scotland have been working on, on carbon metrics for a long time, um, and, and they're going to share today some of their thoughts around going beyond carbon. Uh, and I know that the Green Alliance have always been, been interested in what metrics drive what behaviours and what's the right blend of those metrics. So we're going to hear from Susan on some of that as well. So plenty to get stuck into. Um, as always, uh, drop your questions in, drop your comments in, I'll, I'll filter them into the conversation as we go. Um, it very much is a session that's all about you as an audience. So we can take it in, in a lot of different directions, depending on where the feedback is. So, so don't be shy. Um, and we'll go from there. So First up, uh, I think we're going to go with um, I think we're going to go with Rami, aren't we? Rami, what a it's good to see you, mate. Um, an ex employee of mine, um, doing great things north of the border here in Scotland. How, are you keeping well? Family good? All good, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. It's really lovely to join you in this good. program. Now, now you you are a man who loves a bit of data. You you love a metric. You you've created your own tools in over the years. I know you have. So indeed, so yes. Tell me what's going on in your time at Zero Waste Scotland. What what are you working on at the moment? Um, I feel we're working on really exciting stuff, and I'm really delighted that we're here uh, to talk about it. So uh, I'm sh like first, I have some slides I would like to share. That's all right. Um, okay. So maybe see if someone can see that is um, ready with the slides. But yeah, as I said, like we have some really exciting stuff coming in. And I think so these, I believe, are Susan's slides. Here we go. 
Fantastic. Yeah, it's um, thanks again, Ad yeah, Adam. It's really lovely to be here and discuss this really important and timely topic for our sector. So, um, so just to say, I totally agree with you. Uh, metrics are not something new um, to our sector, and we've been using them for decades, um, whether it's recycling rate, waste arisings, or capture rate, you, you name it. Uh, but these weight-based metrics have been instrumental like in the evolution of our sector, not only in Scotland, but all over um, the world. So next slide, please. Um, so this slide, for example, it shows progress uh, made in Scotland thanks to adopting predominantly weight-based policies. Um, the amount of household waste landfill decreased by nearly 425,000 tons. And the household recycling rate went up by 5%. In my opening presentation, I will explain why it's now necessary uh, more than ever to shift our focus from these weight-based indicators and start exploring impact-driven metrics. And this change is vital. Uh, we need to remember the climate crisis we live in. It's no longer about in increasing recycling rate or even achieving zero waste to landfill. 2019 and 2020 rank among the top three warmest years on record. So that's why we need to shift our focus from weight-based targets and start thinking about the impact of waste on climate change and indeed the wider environment. Uh, next slide, please. So let me just give you an example here, just to explain why we need to go beyond weight-based targets, as Adam mentioned before. So if you are a waste policy officer and you want to increase recycling rate, it doesn't really matter whether you divert one ton of glass or food waste from landfill. However, when you look at the carbon impacts of landfilling glass and food waste, we have a different story to tell, as you can see on the slide the carbon impacts of landfilling food waste is nearly 250 times higher than those associated with landfilling glass. And, and you know, as we live in a climate crisis, as I mentioned before, this is obviously something policymakers need to consider when developing the new strategies moving on. Um, next slide, please. So in Scotland, uh, as Adam mentioned, uh, we've been estimating the carbon impacts of waste since 2011 using our in-house state-of-the-art carbon metric. So what does the carbon metric do? So the carbon metric measures the whole life carbon impacts of waste from resource extraction and manufacturing emissions right through to waste management emissions. The carbon metric is now included in Scotland's official waste data statistics and their insights have fit into the development of policies such as Scotland's food waste reduction target, for example, or the 2 million tick site innovation fund announced by the Scottish government last year. Next slide, please. Um, so the carbon metric has indeed you know, helped us to better understand the impact of waste on warming our planet and introduce specific measures to target carbon intensive materials. So the carbon metric, so is the carbon metric the answer to this webinar's question? Um, personally, I don't think so. The carbon metric provides limited insights into the true environmental cost of waste. Um, focusing only on the carbon impacts of waste might lead to the development that shift the problem from climate change to other issues such as biodiversity or resource depletion. And that's why it's now time, I believe, to go beyond carbon. Next slide, please. Um, here is an example just to explain why we should go beyond carbon. Uh, many people see bio-based plastics as the best alternative option to reduce our reliance on fossil plastics and cut our carbon emissions. And that's true, you know, the carbon impacts of bio-based plastics are substantially lower than those of fossil plastics. But when you start looking at other impact categories, we have a different story to tell, as you can see on the slide. Bio-based plastics 
have higher environmental burden in four out of the six areas shown on the slide. Um, if you want to know more about our argument here and why new metrics are now necessary, feel free to scan the QR code, obviously after this session, to read our latest article on, on the topic. Next slide, please. So in Scotland, um, Zero Waste Scotland has embarked on a very exciting and challenging journey to develop a Scottish waste environmental footprint tool, what we call it, referred to as SWIFT. So SWIFT is a life cycle assessment based tool to quantify the environmental impacts of waste in Scotland. SWIFT aims you know, to support policymakers in understanding the impact of waste on the wider environment as the carbon metric on its own fails to reflect the total environmental cost of waste. SWIFT as a tool covers 16 different environmental indicators, but I will mention here our key public facing ones. Obviously climate change you know, sits at the top of the list. We have air quality, material use, land use, and water scarcity. And for those who are interested in other indicators included in SWIFT, you can check them out in our indicators report available on the Zero Waste Scotland website. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide um, shows the result of our SWIFT analysis using the 20, Scotland's 2018 household waste data. Um, as you can see on the slide, food waste has the highest environmental burden in three out of the five key indicators covered. Textile is a really very interesting one to discuss here. You know, although textile it doesn't have a significant contribution in terms of weight and tonnages, it has the highest burden in two areas, including climate change. Um, so I've added a link to our latest article in the Sephora magazine discussing these results and what we learned from our work in this area. So again, feel, feel free to check them out you know, if you're interested by scanning the QR code. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and just to end by saying, you know, SWIFT aims at being a thermometer, a thermometer of the environmental impacts of waste and materials discarded in Scotland. SWIFT could help us to not only reduce waste and increase recycling, but also contributing to the decarbonization of the waste sector while ensuring other knock-on impacts are considered and mitigated accordingly. So yeah, that's all uh, for me, Adam, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. Thank, thanks, Rami. Really, really fascinating. I mean, the journey Scotland's been on has been exceptional. It, it is the market leader in the UK, certainly possibly in Europe, in terms of having set some very clear policy objectives based around the carbon analysis that's happened over the last four or five years. And, and you know, the, the attention on food waste has then been replicated elsewhere as we've all kind of like woken up to that to that agenda. I, I just wonder just quickly, are all of those criteria equally important um, in SWIFT or, or can you or do you mix and match the importance of one? Well, criteria? That's a very, very interesting question. Adam. I think, I've, yeah, this is something actually we are looking at at this stage. So basically, with SWIFT, it will give us these numbers. And obviously, you cannot compare apples against oranges because you have climate change and then you have resource depletion, two different units. And what we are working on right now, we're working with our stakeholders in order to come up with a way to first normalize these results and then weight them based on our preference in Scotland. So like obviously, let's say climate change now is a really big issue. But maybe in the future, you know, once we have a very effective and cheap carbon capture mm -hmm. technology, actually climate change might not be an issue in five or 10 years. So, so yeah, it depends on the waiting, how we see things evolving. Okay. Uh, obviously, it's something that we will be reviewing on yeah annual basis. Yeah. Interesting. I'm going I'm to ask you a specific question about SWEFT, and then we'll bring Susan in, because I, th I think you know, she's just just ready to come in with some interesting questions of her own, I'm sure. But uh, about SWIFT, how do so the question is, how do textiles have a higher carbon impact given food production overall is 25% of global greenhouse gases and textiles is only quoted at being between four and 8%? Well, with textile, the way we look at 
textile waste and sweat we covered because we covered the whole life carbon impacts you know and obviously um we looked at textile waste in scotland and what's made from like we're looking at well, whether it's um plant based like cotton textile or polybester or okay. like fossil blade. so we've been looking at these things and because we're looking at the whole global supply chain we, we can manage to capture the whole um impacts so that's why you know the numbers we have actually we're also like surprised with these numbers but then when we start digging deeper we realized that actually like fabric manufacturing is really carbon intensive technology especially when you see significant amount of fabric used in scotland is imported from far east you know areas that usually have you know very carbon intensive energy um which way so yeah and this actually might you know like put some questions on the table for policymakers about you know how they can look at this sort of the idea of offshoring our carbon impacts you know to other countries sure thank you and I, I think it's been really interesting to, to watch how you know our per perception about good materials and bad materials if you like or good sectors and bad sectors has been over overwritten uh, by some of the analysis that's happened in the last few years because you know, in Scotland, you, you may have a more widespread food waste collection system than we do in England, for example. And, and, and that's partly because Scotland has recognised food waste as being a major issue and has put policy in place to address it. England's only playing catch up at the moment. So I think, you know, that's where metrics and tools come in really handy because they, they've enabled policymakers to go, we probably do need to do something about that, even though it maybe isn't the public eye hot topic everybody wants to talk about plastics well actually in your analysis plastics doesn't rate as highly as, as certain other materials does it thank you right susan as she grabs a drink we're going to bring you into the debate a, a wider perspective no doubt how are you susan susan from from green alliance are you well yeah i'm very well thanks are you See, in I'm scotland a, at the moment i am in scotland i'm actually not far from rami <laughs> Very good, very good. Would, would a bit of global warming improve the temperature up there or? Um... It's been a really mild January again already. <laughs> I mean, it's been quite a while since I had frost on the ground when I woke up. Wow. Um, Climate yeah, there's people changing. digging holes outside my house at the moment. I don't think they're having much trouble, you know, digging in the ground. It's not especially frozen. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, welcome, welcome. And I know the Green Alliance has spent a lot of time thinking about metrics and, and, and targets and, and, you know, encouraging government to, to think and rethink its kind of approach to life. So the floor's yours. Okay, um, so I jump straight to my slides then. Um, a nice colorful first slide. I just found a nice colorful abacus just because I liked it. Um, so I suppose my talk's gonna be a bit more about um, the circular economy bro more broadly um, rather than waste. Um, so the question I'm posing is how should we measure progress on a circular economy? Um, and I use the word should there rather than can, because I'm not just interested in what are the possibilities, but there's also, you know, there are some judgments to be made about what we think is, is most important, what are the best ways of doing this. <clears throat> um, just to, for those who aren't familiar with Green Alliance, we're an environmental policy think tank um, based down in London, um, though I work remotely from Scotland. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. So, why do we need a circular economy? So I think if you're going to talk about metrics, we've got to just not move too far away from the, the basic. What are we trying to achieve? Um, so let's try and keep the, the, the reasons behind wanting a circular economy front of front and centre. Um, <clears throat> so globally, extraction, production and processing of resources um, accounts for around half of greenhouse gas emissions and um, over 90% of some other impacts like biodiversity loss and water stress. So that's again, going back to, to Rami's excellent work. Um, that's, you know, I think resource use captures quite a lot of different environmental impacts. There's other impacts like severe pollution and things like that, depending on which type of material it is you're extracting. So we can't tackle climate change without addressing resource use. Um, it does need to get on the agenda at the COP at some point. Um, and resource use is quite a good sort of catch-all indicator for a broad range of environmental impacts. Um, so I can't, or maybe I didn't ask to go on to the next slide there in time. That was the, the numbers I just mentioned, sorry. Um, you can go on one more slide as well. So this picture comes from Circle Economy, a think tank in the Netherlands that measures global circularity. Um, 
And their work, their latest work shows that the global economy uses over 100 billion tons of materials each year. That's the amount that kind of goes in and goes through the economy. Um, and of that, only under 9% is actually cycled back in. So that's their kind of you know, crude measure of, of circular economy. It's quite a useful overview. Um, and they estimate that by just doubling that amount, so if we manage to reach roughly 17%, circularity at a global level, we could close the emissions gap that we currently see when we look at the, the pledges from governments um, to meet the Paris Agreement target of under two degrees warming. So you don't need to even you know, aim for 100% circularity, even some quite modest increases in the level of circularity by their measure could have pretty huge impacts in carbon terms. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so how do we cut the impact of our materials use? I think the thing to emphasize here, it's not just about recycling. So if you go back to that, there's the 100 billion tons of materials that we're using. Um, imagine the, the scale of the recycling infrastructure that would be needed if we tried to solve this problem completely through recycling. So imagine all the energy going into those recycling processes and so forth. And you know, here, just thinking about us here in the UK, we're already exporting quite an alarming amount of our waste um, that gets classified as recycled. Um, so I think it's just a sensible approach is that with, given the scale of the challenge, we have to intervene at all parts of the life cycle of those products. So we want to use less, use it for longer and also recycle it. Um, okay, so next slide. I'm going to talk a bit about England. I'm aware that the audience isn't exclusively from England, but that's been my policy focus um, of late. So. <clears throat> In England, some first steps are being taken towards targets that could help reach a circular economy. Um, at Green Alliance, we, we think that resource use needs to be taken as seriously as climate change, um, given the links and the impacts. And so we were quite excited that when the Environment Act came in, a major piece of environmental legislation post Brexit, um, it gave the government the power to bring in legally binding long term targets on various environmental issues, but including resources and waste. So that's quite a big opportunity. Um, but are they making the most of this power? Um, next slide, please. The targets that are being proposed um, and which will be consulted on probably next month, um, we expect to be to double resource productivity by 2050 um, and to cut residual waste per person. So cut the waste going to landfill and incineration per person. So the questions that I ask when I look at these targets are, will they lead to a cut in our overall raw material use? Um, and so have that environmental impact that we want to see? And will they help us to move up the waste hierarchy? Because we've got a real focus on, on recycling at the moment in a lot of the policy initiatives happening. And then we, we need to go further up towards reuse, repair, circular business models, circular design. That, that's what we would need to see happen for a major transition. <clears throat> so next slide, please. So looking first at resource productivity. <clears throat> so we expect the definition to be um, the amount of GDP produced per unit of raw material consumption. <clears throat> so the strength of, of this indicator would be well, if we did cut raw material use and move up the moved up the waste hierarchy, it would support the target. That's fair. Um, but the question is, will it actually incentivize that to happen? Um, so the limitations um, of setting it against GDP are that it could be achieved just through GDP growth, for example, while keeping material consumption steady. Um, it doesn't account for some materials having higher environmental impacts. So again, just going back to some of what Rami said there, you know. Anything that's, that's quite a blunt tool based on weights, um, you know, it's got, it, it could potentially lead to, to unforeseen impacts switching across different materials and that kind of thing. But I think the most important point really is that it's very un, unambitious, um, doubling it by 2050. Um, from what I've heard, we're on track to meet or exceed this target anyway without any further policy intervention. Um, and when you compare it against what some other countries in Europe are doing, like Germany and Austria, um, they've set more ambitious targets than this. You know, I think we could be going further. <clears throat> so it's probably not enough on its own to drive us to a real transition to a circular economy. 
Um, next slide, please. I'm just checking that I'm looking at the right slides. Yep. So the next target is cutting residual waste per person, and that's likely to be defined in terms of the tons of residual waste per person, excluding some major construction waste streams. So <clears throat> there's a strength to excluding the major construction waste, um, I suppose, in that it could make it, uh, it could allow you to focus on higher impact materials when you're thinking downstream impacts particularly. Um, so I can sort of see the rationale for that. Um, but I'll come back to that in a moment. The Similar to the other target, if we transition to a circular economy, if we cut our raw material use, um, it would support this target. There'd be less, less going into the system, less coming out of the system as waste, so it would help. But again, I question whether this will um, do enough to incentivize a really significant transition. Um, a lot will hinge on the level of ambition, I suppose, which we don't know yet. Um, and there's a question about whether this will just be set to align with existing recycling targets and will just kind of join a package of existing measures which aim to increase recycling, which, you know, I do want to see and it's good to increase recycling and improve it. Um, but will it lead to that real transition and you move us up the waste hierarchy? I, I'm not sure at the moment. Um, and again, going back to that construction waste issue. We don't want to just think in terms of the downstream impacts. You know, construction materials have some really significant upstream impacts. <laughs> um, so that leaves potentially a bit of a gap on how we help to incentivize a shift to circular, a circular economy and construction, which is already an industry that, you know, while there's some really good ideas and initiatives and technologies emerging for doing that, there are real problems around incentivizing that shift at scale. So again, I would say this is probably not enough on its own. Um, next slide, please. So is there a better option? Um, you can move on to the next slide as well. At Green Alliance, we've proposed that we should aim to halve our total resource consumption by 2050. <clears throat> and the possible ways of defining that, I suppose, are up for debate, but um, from an environmental perspective, total raw material consumption would be better because the environment only really cares about the absolute amounts of impacts. Um, but it may be more acceptable or realistic or arguably fair to, to make it a per person target. Uh, the strength of that is that, I mean, if you think about halving resource use, that's pretty huge. So it's quite an ambitious target. Um, and so it would definitely ensure lower environmental impact over time and it would require all kinds of interventions throughout life cycles of goods and products. Um, so we'd have to reduce and reuse as well as recycle stuff. Um, there are still definitions, you know, but there's no perfect target and metric. The data for a start would need some investment, though I think that's the same for the resource productivity target, to be fair. Um, and again, it's quite, you know, it's that blunt tool, so it doesn't account for some materials having higher environmental impacts than others or different environmental impacts. So we would say that at a minimum, it, it needs to be broken down then into sector and material specific targets and plans um, and to embed this idea that you've got to avoid material substitution. You have to aim for reductions in each independent area. Um, I think we can move on to the next slide. So I think some just yeah, some final thoughts just to finish up, um, and that's supposed to be a symbol for reduce, reuse, recycle there on, on the right in case it's not clear. Um, so I think any any metric to try and drive a transition to a circular economy should keep in mind um, we need to reduce the environmental impacts of our resource use and reduce our total raw material use. Um, but also should be trying to drive us up the waste hierarchy, so it shouldn't purely be depending on recycling. And I think that's that's about it. Final slide. Thank you, Susan. I, oh, there's some fascinating stuff in there, um, which you whistle stop through. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I think you're absolutely right. This idea of some kind of target around resource consumption seems to be a natural uh replacement for a carbon metric which has got us so far on a journey um and as you say resource is kind of all-encompassing reflects a lot of different impacts it seems to be you know it could be the one metric of to, to move to but 
you know, you've already raised this issue about, you know, fairity and equity and, 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 you know, is it, is it a per capita or is it total and would the planet cope if we continue growing as a species? No, it wouldn't. So I think, you know, you've raised a lot of uncertainty. How likely are, are a government, not just the UK government, but any government to go, do you know what, we're going to cut resource consumption by 2050, preferably in half. I mean, do, do you think it's a well, vote winner? The Dutch government has actually announced um, something along these lines. So they've um, put in an objective of a 50% reduction in use of primary raw materials. Um, I think possibly defining it for certain specific materials um, mm -hmm. by 2030. <laughs> so um, that's okay. for specific material streams. So I, I don't, I'm not sure that that's a legally binding target. So we'll see what, what happens with that. Um, oh. But yeah, there are there are some moves in that direction, um, and also I suppose you know there are options for what we do if we decide to go with the the resource productivity target that's being proposed. For example, depending on how we choose to break that down and implement it, you could try and come up with some fairly similar outcomes to a resource consumption reduction target. If you decide that okay, as part of that resource productivity target, we've got to make sure that raw material consumption comes down within each specific sector yeah. and you know maybe set some some targets for particular problematic materials within that so you could you know could, could still do something within what's being proposed that that would have best have a bit more ambition thank you and would there be particular material streams or sectors that you would target in that subsectoral approach? Because I mean, Rami's highlighted one or two material streams that you've just got to deal with because carbon metrics. But actually, the SWIFT toolkit is also saying these are these are a must must you know deal with. I uh, you know in in your space are there are there one or two material streams or sectors that really need to to you know pull their finger out or have some specific targets set for them? Um, well, I've already mentioned construction as. <laughs> a pretty significant one i think the scale of the impact i, I think i often think of construction because my, my partner works in infrastructure and you know just the scale of the materials you know he's working on the corrie glass dam up in in um up near fort william at the moment and the sheer amounts of concrete and steel that will go into a project like that just swamp a lot of things that we kind of see day to day in you know the sort of recycling and things that we do um so i personally would love to see some more initiatives in, in that sector but yeah I was, I was going to quickly deflect that question to Rami because he probably has much better insights of what has the worst impacts yeah, by material stream. <laughs> um, well th th actually <clears throat> so yeah um, I think when it comes to construction it's a really important area and I know there is lots of work going on looking at embedded carbon in the construction industry and how you know governments and even companies they can set their own targets on because they want to look at the upstream you know carbon impacts of their you know, construction activities. So I totally agree. I think this is a really a very, very interesting area. But also, I think here, I think there are like two things. First, I think as people like working in the waste sector, we need to um, sort of admit that we can do our part, but we can't do everything. When it comes to circular economy, it goes beyond the waste hierarchy. So you need to talk to product designers. You need to talk policymakers working in international, international trade, but like manufacturing all these sectors so it's not really just on the waste sector and i think we, this is something we need to keep in mind when it comes to um cut raw material in the consumption like for us as a waste sector i think we've done some really useful like interventions and measures we're talking about the plastic tax for example so now we tax plastic if they're not including any sort of recycled content and i think it's like 30 percent yep. um like that carrier back play as well so it's Again, like we're trying to, you know, disencourage people from using, you know, single use disposable carrier packs by, you know, charging them for it. So as a waste sector, I think we are taking some really steps towards, you know, reducing demand on raw material. But yeah, but also we need to admit that it's something that goes beyond, you know, our boundaries. But having said that, it doesn't mean that we need to just sit down and relax. I think we should reach out to other sectors. We need to talk to them. Uh, and that's why we have people like Adam Reed. <laughs> you know, it's just his job is basically going out and talking to policies and you know people from different industries. You know, yeah. About and I would um, 
I totally echo that. It's, it's such a cross, um, a cross sector, cross departmental issue. And one thing that I'd flag up is that at the moment, um, DEFRA, who are responsible for you know, resources and waste in England, um, do you have a sort of joint initiative going on with Bayes, which is a sort of uh, business energy innovation and skills, I want to say. Um, <laughs> um, so because there is, you know, that's kind of an area where you can't do it all with the powers that the environment agency holds you know so you do need to kind of work together and you know, obviously they're working with other departments as well but i think that's just one example where um yeah it, it's interesting because if defra sets a target and then doesn't have all the levers to actually achieve that target you know how does that work you've got to make sure you've got everyone else on board you know it might be the business department it might be transport it you know it might be the treasury who needs to adjust the tax system you know there's all kinds of things that could come into play here I, I think you both raised some really interesting points there about sort of cross sector and cross governmental departmental agendas, because, you know, somebody that's lived under a, a DEFRA kind of uh, guiding hand for many years, you know, their targets are always about things that they can measure, because if you can't measure them, the, the targets irrelevant, isn't it? Because nobody knows if you met it or not. So you start looking at things in your silo. And I think, the, the, you know, Rami, you've made this point, Susan, you've made this point, circularity resource consumption per, per se has nothing to do with one silo it has everything to do with society at large and how we how, how we how we we make you know make and break stuff and and therefore you know having a having a target that might be nice and black and white and very linear and quite easy to to to, to know whether you're making progress or not in your silo is actually not helping that transition to something that's more holistic more complicated by all right you know all means it's um it's uh, i was having a chat with uh some some family the other weekend and we were talking about you know should you go on holiday and fly or should you become vegan and you know how do you measure the co the, the comparable carbon benefits and disbenefits and you know and that's complicated enough but now i'm gonna i'm gonna overlay land use and water and you know immediately my, my mum's gone yeah shut up this is this is way too complicated for me so i think we've got to think about you know some of these some of these issues right we've got some questions rami um we we we, we got a dude who's very interested in talking to you so i'm going to share your email and his email sweater afterwards and they can talk tools to the cows come home um unless they're vegan of course um lots of agreement on the uh, on the panels here thank you right agreed at metrics need to consider resource use up front Measuring waste is, is a lagging indicator. I love that. Well done. Uh, question though, um, local authorities. So obviously we've got some local authorities on, on, on the line. Uh, are, are they using your carbon tool now, Rami? Are they using SWIFT? Are they going to use SWIFT? Are you forcing it? And, and Susan, when you come in, are DEFRA requiring people to do an LCA or a life cycle assessment? Or, or is, there a, you know, is there a common approach to bringing new products into the market <laughs> or, or what? I mean... You know, it's, it sounds like a bit of a wild west here at the moment. Yeah, Rally. well, okay, okay, so I'll start with SWIFT, so, um, and the current metrics. So at the moment, we are on the, looking at the nationwide scale of Scotland, so we're not looking at specific local authorities uh, for one key reason, which is basically data. So obviously, data is the key challenge for us to find, like, local authority-specific, you know, numbers to run SWIFT or the current metric. So in theory, if we have the data, we can run SWIFT like on local authority level. So okay. that can be done for sure. Um, the second, but obviously the challenge is, you know, it's going to be a really time consuming process. And, and Susan, she mentioned, you know, data needs investment. And the question like whether like local authorities or even like central government, they have the financial resources and commitments to run these things um, in a local level, but it can be done in three. And actually we are really interested to sort of pilot it in a local authority level in, like in Scotland, maybe in, in a year or so, but we'll see how it goes. And yeah, and maybe we can have another session where we can talk about these sort of micro targets, you know, for cities or and districts. There we go. Rami's put a call out to the world, um, but preferably a Scottish local authority. But exactly, yeah. <laughs> you know, if there's if there's a municipality out there on the uh, you know on another continent, contact Rami anyway. I'm I'm sure they'd be interested in in testing the tool. Um, Susan, you, uh, following up from that, I, I sort of asked you both the same question, didn't I? I mean, uh, about um, stip um, stipulating you must use certain tools and metrics 
to you know inform your decisions when it comes to policies or infrastructure or services is that happening are, are local authorities in your experience you know knowing what to do and where to go i don't think it's is that standardized at the moment i mean obviously for for policy decisions then you know we have things like you know the green book guidance and there have been some quite interesting updates to that um in recent years um things like um putting up the carbon <laughs> value would be a good example um and things like allowing a bit more scope for qualitative analysis of things like well-being impacts so there's kind of some interesting changes there and i think i wonder if um the work that rami's developing could one day actually play a role in kind of you know making those kind of impact assessments much more nuanced um i was kind of reflecting on what you were saying earlier you know how it's hard to compare apples and oranges and we've, we've had this way of assessing decisions so whether it's a policy decision or a major investment decision through numbers you know you kind of like feed stuff into an economic cost benefit analysis model and churn a number out the end then we try and do the same thing with environmental impacts and it's better than not trying to cost in the environmental impacts but you do get to a point where when you try to get to the you know the level of nuance that rami is dealing with like is that really the most helpful way and there's been some quite interesting work um on you know potentially taking more qualitative approaches and like logic based approaches mm -hmm. to making these decisions that allow for more nuanced discussion around this sort of thing so there was an interesting study i'm trying to remember who did it so maybe someone else will know um that i read a few months ago where they look back on some of the major decisions that have been made so for example you look at germany when they made that decision to really strongly subsidize the rollout of solar energy if you'd done a cost benefit analysis it never would have come out as do that you know and so some of the most impactful examples that have helped us deal with you know environmental crises wouldn't have been done yep. based on our typical decision making methodology so that makes me think we probably need to reassess our decision making methodology to be able to come up with the right outcomes that's that's, that's a very fair point actually i mean as, as a business so with my Suez hat on over the last couple of years we've we've really adopted the triple bottom line approach to to, to, to running our business which means we give equal importance to the social benefits and disbenefits of, of a policy, a, a service or, a, or an infrastructure, as we do to the environmental, which, of course, is the reason we exist. But we also have to make a turn. We have to be profitable. We have to be otherwise, you know, we can't invest in communities and equally our shareholders would kind of frown upon us. So, so you know, when you're weighing them up, you're right. You, there isn't a spreadsheet where you can just plug the same numbers in and go, oh, yeah, the economic benefit is outweighed by this environmental bit, blah, blah, blah. It just doesn't exist. So you try and valorize environment and you try and valorize social impact and, and actually they're quite tough to do because there's lots of tools and indicators out there that will tell you that the answer is x or y but they don't all agree so we still end up with apples and bananas right um i'm going to ask a poll question sweater i, I, I want to get the audience opinion on something because i want to bring it back to the original question so my question for the uh, for the audience quick quick vote please is that all right sweater if we put one up yep fingers up uh have carbon targets or metrics as used by government, whether it be municipal or national, been effective in enabling decarbonisation? Think about it over the last two or three years. Uh, and it's yes, very effective. Yes, somewhat effective. Uh, not really effective. And I didn't follow the question. So accept that one. I'm, I've no idea. And in the meantime, while people are voting, so tick the one, you, you, you click the box that kind of um, you like the most, please. And um, in the meantime, just a quick one for you, Susan. Recent COPs, um, this whole ambition to reduce the use of raw material by 50%. Have you heard it mooted anywhere? Are there any of the devolved administrations talking about it or any government departments nodding in your direction going, I like the sound of that? I mean, what, what kind of feedback are you getting? Yeah, I think um, there has been a statement in Wales, and you can be on the spot now, and I'm going to forget exactly what they've said. Um, but there has been a statement of intent to cut yes. resource consumption. Um, and I know there's an opportunity in Scotland because there's a circular economy bill being developed at the moment, and this is something they could they could consider including. Um, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's something that people are aware of as an option. I think there are some there's some quite understandable sort of limitations around things like the data. Like at the moment, the data it would rely on might have a four year lag, for example, yeah. if, if we didn't do something about that data. But, you know, like you said, we could invest in that. Um, but I think the bigger concern isn't so much about getting the data. The bigger concern is 
but how would we do it yeah. if we set this target? Which is why I think it's really important for um, organizations like mine and others to start doing some more work around helping answer that question. Like, what would this look like? You know, if you if you broke it down and um, and yeah, I think if you could kind of reassure that there are pathways that are viable, um, you know, perhaps start with certain sectors and things like that, you know, sure. then you can make progress. And, and we know there are some great technologies out there that are going to be able to cut carbon footprints, if nothing else. C cutting resource consumption footprints might be slightly harder, of course. Right, let's have a look. Scores on the doors. 60% said somewhat effective, 33% not effective. Rami, are you surprised or, or is that kind of on the money? No, it's, yeah, I think so. I would, yeah, if I had just, I would say also somewhat effective. I, again, it's not about setting the target. Oh, look, a, a target that's on, it's effective. But the, the, I think that question here, the key question is, how long do you need to hit that target at the, at the time scale you're working for? Because obviously, as I said, like, we live in a climate crisis. So, like, at the moment, like, in Scotland, they have target, like, net zero for 20. 45, I believe, and in the UK it's 2050. Yep. Um, so these, like, we bought these targets based on the current status quo, but the question, like, like, is it that's the right thing? Do we need to accelerate our transition to a net zero society? So that's going to be really the interesting one. But obviously, it's a very difficult question. And, and I can see, like, why politicians, economists, they, they can't really give an answer on this. And, uh. I it's a tricky, it's a tricky one. Well, well I, th I think we're at the beginning of a journey, aren't we? I mean, yeah, it's only three, three or four years ago, we didn't really have a, a you know, a net zero or decarbonisation agenda. I, mean, I know we had, carbon, you know, the climate for, um, on, on, on um, the Committee on Climate Change was starting to put together its budgets, looking at, you know, what yeah. the future money to look at. But it's only the last few years that it's really started to, to, to become modern language for local authorities, my mum, you know, the media, uh, the list goes on. And so, you know, judging its, its effect, you would argue, I think it's become more common language. I think people now kind of get it to a degree. They might not always know what they can do about it. And I'm going to ask a question about that in a moment. But, um, but at least it's, it, the, the journey's begun. My, my concern is, if it does take us 30 years to get to that end point, are we getting to the end of the wrong point in 30 years' time? Because we've gone, yes, we decarbonized. I, no, we've run out of planets worth of resources. Oops, we never got to 2050. The world's in chaos. And that's kind of the worry that I've always had about metrics, isn't it? That the metric focuses your mind. We had weight-based targets oh. and suddenly you start recycling stuff that you shouldn't recycle. Garden waste, for example. Don't collect it. Don't capture it. It sits in your garden. And I think, you know, we've got to be very careful that the de decarbonisation carbon targets don't get in the way of set Susan's targets, which could well be the ones that save the planet, save society, and give us a platform to grow from. So that's the kind of message here. Right, I want to ask another question. Sweater, can we have poll number three? Because it's the carbon question. And then I'm going to come back to the audience who are starting to wake up with some interesting questions of their own. So um, I'm just interested, we've been talking about carbon a lot here. So how much carbon reduction do you think you, you as an individual, can achieve based on your consumer choices and your material consumption choices alone. So forget about carbon capture and storage, forget about the hydrogen economy, forget all of the things that might happen with the technology folks. Just think about the things you do, the things you buy, the things you use, the way you travel, okay? That's what I'm interested in. So could you reduce your carbon footprint by under 20%, 20 to 40%, 40 to 60%, 60 to 80%, or could you just basically not carbon on the head because you're gonna make some good decisions or you've already made some good decisions for those of you that have. And you know what those decisions are, you know, veganism, you know, oh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to work at home four days a week. I'm going to use public transport. We're always going to lift share. I've got a, you know, hybrid vehicle. I've got an electric vehicle. The list goes on, doesn't it? I'm only going to walk, et cetera, et cetera. So vote now, please. Oh, somebody at my front door. And in the meantime, Rami, just tell me a little bit about this. What do you think the answer is going to be? Um, it depends. It depends how we are really committed and keen to, you know, to fight. Um, so personally, I would say for myself, not for the household, I would say I'm 60%, 60 to 80%, but it's a bit towards the lower end. Um, wow. And Susan, surely that's, that's, so see, I, that, so it's that. interesting that, uh, Rami didn't include the rest of the household there, so you, you don't you don't think that the 
the baby's going to be playing its part here. No. <laughs> I, I think I, I, Rami clearly can't speak on behalf of his of recently newborn child because you know that would be that would be unfair. But here we go. What do the audience had to say? So look, we've got thirty nine percent saying I can do well. Look, let's take that's the top in, two. That's interesting. Sixty yeah. percent, basically sixty plus percent can do forty percent or or less. And then we've got you know a big you know thirty percent going. I can I can do sixty to eighty percent. I I need to meet these people. Yeah, rock yeah. and roll. I mean, I think probably most people are in a quite similar position to me in that it's quite hard to do that estimate because, you know, off the top of your head, um, yeah. you're not qu always quite sure how, how much impact you could have. I would be very quite cautious. I mean, I try and you know, take, do do a lot of the thing, the obvious things like not flying and not eating much meat. Um, but um, there, uh, yeah, I mean, cutting your resource consumption, cutting your carbon footprint by 60 to 80 percent, I think I suspect would be really <laughs> quite challenging. Um, there's you know, certain minimum things it's hard it's hard to not do uh, probably in my case car use because i live in a fairly rural area and have kids and there's often like not really a viable alternative the buses coming once an hour isn't always that helpful um so yeah i, I think it's interesting that there's a spread though because it, it does that spread reflect um levels of ambition or does it just reflect that some people are a bit a bit less optimistic about what, what in fact even quite ambitious <laughs> oh, 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 things are having yeah, I would also say it depends on people's circumstances. You know, as you said, like some people they have kids, they have, you know, they live in remote areas. So again, it depends on people and, you know, yeah. what. But I think, I think I, my instinct is that it would be quite hard to, to cut it by, you know, more than half yourself, um, possibly even less than that, because I think we do need to rely on, um, you know, businesses to play their part in terms of making thing, making it possible for us to access the things we need. You know, I, I might have all the, the right aims and ideals in the world, but it just might not be available around in the area where I live, you know, to be able to access goods and services. I mean, I'm quite, actually quite lucky where, where in the area where Rami and I live, you know, we have things like a, a, a local tool library and reuse hub um, just opening up at the moment. And, you know, we're quite well served, you know, volunteers doing repair services and things like that, which is all the kind of thing we'd like to, to see more of to enable lifestyles like that um so i do not own a power drill which i did hire one last time because i so rarely have any call to use one this is a, I, I'm, I'm i'm glad i'm learning about your lack of power tools susan on this session today lack but, of um, desire to use power tools well me too to be honest with you so you know we're, we're on that one well i'm a little bit worried that this is turning into some kind of you know tourism r us for, for for parts of scotland at the moment and you know <laughs> could you could you imagine the, the carbon footprint that all these tourists descend to learn about the circular economy park that one right conscious of time um thank you for the um for the commentary i've got one more poll question and this is the one that really is where the where the debate started today because i don't think that carbon is the end goal in our world of metrics and rami's introduced some of the complexities and susan's introduced some new metrics that she'd use albeit she's explained that they're very difficult um so if we were going to go beyond carbon because you know adam says carbon gets me to the wrong end point what would you pick? Would it be a resource consumption based metric? Would it be one that focused on air quality, for example, which if you're living in, in an urban inner city, you might say that's the most important metric. Would it be a biodiversity metric? Would it be one that represents land use? Rami's already showed just how much land use can be a factor in some of these material streams. Would it you would you go, oh sorry, just go with recycling rates. I understand that one. I I I live in that world already. It's it's easy. Or, or would you go carbon? I get it you know, the metrics are developing, the tools are developing, it works. Take your pick. Um, Rami, obviously you're voting for um, for something beyond carbon. So I presume resource consumption would be your your pick because it's the most uh, encompassing of the uh, of the metrics. Is that about right? It's exactly, yeah, I would, I would go for it. But the question is um, how we can measure it and how we can get there. That's the challenge we're facing well, at the moment. I, um, I'm, look, I'm looking forward to another webinar where we, we dig a little deeper on, on how to solve that equation for you. I think it would be a very, very interesting <laughs> one. And I think it's something like, um, not just the Scottish government, like even like different base and all countries you would be interested in because as Susan mentioned, like there are different ways to do it. And the question like, what's the best way to set a consumption target? Yeah, because you don't want to stymie the economy. And equally, yeah. you know, a lot of people think that well-being is all about what they consume. And we've got to be careful that we undo that, but we don't yeah. then turn everybody into hermits and, you know, everybody's sad. I mean, I think there's some really interesting, you know, balances to be had. Yeah. Right, Susan, here we go. Look, resource consumption got 68% of the vote. You won. 
Although I think Rami was supporting you, so there was only really one answer here. But look, look <laughs> at that. Eleven percent have gone biodiversity, and we've not really talked about it much. So I mean, that shows that that more, you know, that, that beyond carbon is an important issue here. I think people recognise that carbon isn't the end game. Yeah, and even yeah, within resource consumption, you'd want to look at what's having most impact on something like biodiversity, wouldn't you? So again, like trying to introduce that nuance in how you develop material-specific plans. Sweater, could we put that up once more? Sorry, just for everybody. Was, there were so many options on there, but generally they weren't very popular. But um, just for everybody's uh, enjoyment, there we go. Land use and recycling, pretty much the same. Air quality, the same. So I think, I think, I think what what I'm recognising from that, Rami, is that it's not about a single metric that that the future isn't another single metric is it the future has to be a metric that's got nuance to it that's, that's got that has got complexity beneath it yeah that's not 100 true and um, i think also again it's not just about setting these like tides and stuff also we need to look beyond carbon because we need to understand other impacts and at least if we cannot re- cut them we need to mitigate these impacts as i talked before so so again this is like yeah because you don't want to fix the climate change issue and end up with yep. a land use problem or biodiversity and, and so yeah so it's basically you need to understand and then mitigate if you cannot you very know, wise words my friend very wise words because you know the answer to carbon is not to carbon offset by planting lots and lots and lots of forests and having no biodiversity that is not the answer, even though many people will think, well, I bought, you know, I paid, I paid my credits, you know, I've yeah. done my bit. It's a bit like recycling. I've recycled, I've done my bit, but I'm still buying from Amazon every week. Other online shop, shopping platforms are available, of course. Um, mm. Yeah, we've got to, you've got to reconfigure the discussion, haven't we? And yeah. I think it's really important that we've started with today's topic. So thank you. Listen, audience, you've been brilliant. Thanks for the question. Sorry for the time change, but don't worry. You can watch this back whenever you like. You just won't get live questions and answers, but that's okay. Um, Susan, takeaway message, a hashtag, a, a quote. Keep it short and sweet, please. Uh, we need to cut consumption, but that doesn't necessarily mean not being able to have access to the things that we, we want to need in our day-to-day life. Go Brilliant. Rent that drill. Hashtag rent that drill. <laughs> I'm taking that one. Rami, what you got? It's got to be better than that. Let's go beyond carbon. Very Let's simple. <laughs> Hashtag go beyond carbon. Um, I've got no idea what my takeaway message is other than I've started a journey and I promise in 12 months time, I'll be further down the journey on what are the metrics that are going to support the target. And we need to know what the target is before we start worrying about the metrics because we shouldn't let the tail wag the dog. We need to know where we need to be, halving resource consumption. Then we can define what are the metrics that enable us to measure that progress. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I'm sure I'll be on a Be Waste Wise webinar soon. Sweater, back to you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Rami. And uh, once again, apologies for the change of timing to all of you, including panelists. And uh, like Adam did mention, he is moderating another webinar in about 10 days' time. We've just listed it today. Please go up on our website and register for that webinar. Uh, I'll ensure that the time is right. So <laughs> bye-bye. Have a good day, everyone. Take care. Bye.